In part two of this video series, we're going to revisit an old friend from before all the corona craziness began. The likelihood ratio test strikes back. Before we get into that, and as you progress through the algebra, I want you to keep in mind these two pictures we showed at the end of part one as well. And these two pictures to me give a good visual of what we're getting at when we do an ANOVA test. So on the left, you have the null distribution. Under the null hypothesis of an ANOVA test, all of the results, all of the groups come from the same normal distribution, which has some unknown mean mu. And under the alternative, they come from potentially different normal distributions as exhibited by these three different colored curves on the right. So keep that in mind as we're moving. Now, because the null hypothesis under ANOVA is somewhat complicated, we need to extend the framework by which we talked about the likelihood ratio test. So I'm going to rephrase this, and this is usually considered the generalized likelihood ratio test, but I'm just going to call it LRT for simplicity throughout the rest here, if you don't mind. Under the generalized likelihood ratio test, we are looking at a null hypothesis where I have some unknown parameter theta or potentially vector of parameters theta, which are in some set theta naught. That's a big theta naught, right? So think of this if you're saying it out loud with me at home, theta naught. And under the alternative, I have theta in some other set of parameters, theta 1. Okay. Now, why is this important? Well, under ANOVA, I technically have two parameters. Those are, under the null hypothesis, there's two parameters. There's the mu, which is the common group mean, and there's sigma, which is the common group standard deviation. So in the null hypothesis under ANOVA, I'm basically allowing theta sorry, sigma, excuse me, sigma could be anything positive, right, as a standard deviation, and then I'm just basically saying mu can be any real number, so my theta naught would be a subset of R2 in this case. Now, H1, however, is much more complicated under ANOVA because under H1, my theta now actually has multiple group means that could all be different, and it still has the standard deviation sigma. So now my theta one is going to be a subset of RK plus one in this scenario. So with this framework, with this general framework, then the likelihood ratio test statistic is given by the maximum value of the likelihood function over all values in theta naught. So think of this as the maximum under H naught divided by the maximum likelihood under H1. And of course, we reject H0 if that lambda is sufficiently small. We often wrote this in the form lambda less than or equal to some C star or C or something like that. Okay. So just moving before we move forward, what you have to do in these sorts of scenarios is you're going to have to do two different MLEs, right? You're going to have to compute two different MLEs. One MLE will be computed under the null hypothesis. Okay, So in this case, that would be assuming that all of the yijs come from a normal distribution with the same mean. And then you're going to have to compute a separate MLE under the alternative hypotheses. And then once you do that, you can form this likelihood ratio test statistic and derive your, your rejection region for the hypothesis test. Now. I'm not going to show all of the algebraic details here. I'm going to, in fact, leave some of that to homework, but I want to kind of give you the basic skeleton of the argument. So first of all, under H0, let's focus on this first. All of our observations, yij, are going to be normal with the same mean. Right? This is the common population mean and the same standard deviation. So under that scenario, the likelihood function is actually exactly what we see in our typical situation of random samples from a normal random variable. The only difference is that instead of yi's, I have a double subscript. But really what you can do in this scenario is you can think of these yij's as just laid out in kind of like an array fashion, right, where you have uh, n11, and then you start laying them out again, looking at the next group. So now it'd be one, two, etc. So you could kind of like, think of converting this ray to a list. And so really under H0, the MLEs we're going to get for mu and sigma are exactly the same as they are for a random sample of any IID normal random variables. However, under H1, 
the scenario is slightly different because I have separate group means here, these mu sub j's. So the difference now, you'll notice, is that instead of subtracting mu, a common mean from all the random variables, I'm now subtracting a different mean in our products. However, because they're IID in this scenario, you could still kind of think of this one as having partitioned out, right? I have one product which only involves, if I, if I focus on like a specific A, I here, I could think of having the product of all I of these terms, right? And basically then I have a product of all J of those. So I have this for J equal one, and then that's times the same product or a different product really, but you know, you get what I'm saying for J equals two. Hopefully this is making sense you know, write it out for yourself to convince yourself of this. But essentially what I'm saying here is that under H1, we get K different sub kind of groups of the same thing that you would have when you're doing random samples from a normal random variable. So if you believe all I said on that first slide, and again, I said I'm, I'm going to actually put some of this in the homework anyway, so you're going to have to convince yourself further of it if you want to work it out. But under the null hypothesis, the maximum likelihood estimator of mu is the total mean of all the y's, right? And that just comes from the fact that we saw earlier in the semester, which is that the if, if we have normal random variables, the mean is y bar. In this case, y bar is the mean of everything. And what I'm going to call sigma not hat, uh, sigma not hat of the MLE for sigma under the null hypothesis is very similar to what we had when we did our normal MLEs. So in that case, I had just a sum over i of the yi's minus the y bar squared, except now I'm, I'm subtracting the grand mean and it's a double sum instead of a single sum. In uh, sort of in a similar manner, you can argue that the MLEs in the different means are just going to be the sample means for each group. And the standard deviation will be similar, except now I actually subtract the individual group means here as well. If you're willing to put everything on that previous slide in a side cart or a stroller and take a walk through the garden of algebra, then you will end up with a likelihood ratio test statistic, which is essentially a ratio of two sum of square quantities. In the numerator here, we have the differences between the individual observations and the group means. And in ANOVA, this quantity is often referred to as the SSE or the sum of squared errors. This is your first hint that there's something kind of connective going on with regression where we also had an SSE or SSR term. And in the denominator, we have a similar quantity except the group means have been replaced with the overall mean. And this quantity is what we call the sum of square totals. Now, whenever you have squares of terms that themselves are normal, right? Because remember, under the null hypothesis, which is what we look at this under, the yijs are normal with mean, mu, and variance sigma. That right there means that this term in the denominator here is very likely a chi-squared term. In fact, it is exactly a chi-squared term. So if you go back to our video series, the first video series we put up on the amazing normal distribution, you'll see that this quantity right here If we divide by sigma squared to get standard normals, this term right here is going to be chi-squared distribution with n, the total number of observations, that's the total number of things we're summing over, minus 1 degrees of freedom. That was one of the big results from our first video series. Now, in the numerator, okay, we actually here have now a sum for each of our groups, we have a sum of terms, and I realize I should be using capital YIJs here now because I'm, I'm thinking of them as, as random variables to get a distribution here, estimators, not estimates, right? Notice that each of these, if I divide them by sigma squared, each of these quantities in here is going to be a chi-squared distribution with n sub j minus 1 degrees of freedom, right? That's how many observations are in group j. But then when I add them up, and I know that they're IID, that's, or at least that's one of the assumptions under the model. So when I add up a bunch of independent chi-squared or gamma distributions, I simply need to sum the degrees of freedom 
which means that the total SSE is a chi-square distribution with n, which is the sum of the nj's, minus k, right, because I'm subtracting one for each group degrees of freedom. So our lambda itself ends up being a ratio of two chi-squared statistics. And that's something we haven't seen before, but which has a very common name distribution called the F distribution. And that will be the topic that will lead off our next video.